yeah, I'm welcoming you. Thank you so much for attending our artist talk here uh, this afternoon at the Byrne College of Art. This artist talk is a public event linked with the launch of It's Strange to Be Here, the 2021 MFA degree show at Byrne College of Art. My name is Anya Phillips. I teach sculpture and across the different programs at Byrne College of Art. And I'm going to be hosting the discussion today with our artists um, who are Brittany Baldwin, Shannon Castor, Letitia Hill, Ellen Ferrier, Ashling Jelinski and Sam Khan. If you just bear with me now, I'm letting people enter as well while we're uh, while I'm doing this short intro. You can view images and information about the show on the link that I've posted up in the chat box here. So if any of you want to look at it on your computers while the discussion is happening, but I'll also be showing some images of each artist's work as we're going through the discussion. Perfect. Firstly, I'd like to hand over to our Dean, Conor McGrady, to say a few words about the college and the context of our MFA program and in the context of the show that's happening here and uh, that's opened oh. now. So handing over to you, Connor. Great, thank you, Anya, and I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, you're all very welcome on this uh, Monday afternoon. And uh, so, yeah, just, I'm just going to keep it very brief. But basically, you know, we have six or, or six okay. students graduating through the MFA programs, two programs, in fact. We have the, <laughs> the MFA in Studio Art, and we have Shannon, uh, who is a graduate of the... Uh, will be very shortly a graduate of the MFA in Art and Ecology. Um, the Art and Ecology program brings in aspects of environmental science and has a particular ecological focus. So it's really looking at studio practice and studio research, but with through the expanded, uh, an expanded emphasis on the environment and on, and on ecology. So yeah, we all know this has been a year, uh, uh, a roller coaster of a year. It's, it's had its ups, it's had its downs, and, and so it continues. I think when we were able to open the gallery very, very briefly for last year's MFA, delayed MFA exhibition in September. I think I was echoing somebody who had said uh, we still await a return to precedented times, and I think we're still waiting a return to precedented times. Yeah, these students, this group of students have had a very particular journey. We've been very lucky in that we are a very small campus. And under the, the guidelines this year, uh, 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 practical work was allowed to continue to take place in small research clusters. As what we do at BCA is, is artistic research. We were very, uh, very fortunate to be able to, to avail of, that, of this situation, which practically, uh, in practical terms, meant that the studios were able to stay open and that some of the facilities were able to stay open. All other aspects of college life shut down, the library, the cafe, <laughs> All of our teaching uh, had to be delivered online uh, over the course of this semester in particular. Uh, so I think this, this group of students have been very patient and, uh, and very, very flexible in working with these ups and downs and working with this, uh, this particular dynamic. Uh, and I think the studio access uh, has been the one saving grace uh, of this whole affair. And I think they've been uh, very, very tenacious uh, incredibly ambitious in the studio, incredibly hard working. They put a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of focus into their individual uh, research projects, into their studio practice, into their academic work. And they've also uh, for, uh, formed a support network for each other. They, 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 have become, they have become their own supportive community throughout this, this period of uncertainty. You know, there's a lot of forums right now in terms of Elia, for example, or Paradox looking. Uh, the European art forums are looking at navigating uncertainty uh, and how what, what skills are needed to navigate uncertainty. I think our six graduate and students could very well speak to that very adequately and very clearly about the skills and the and the the, the, the attributes, the personal attributes that, that, that they've taken on and navigating this over the course of the year. So as I said, I'm I'm going to keep it very, very brief. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I, this exhibition, it's unfortunate that you, our audience, can't be here in person to see the end of year exhibition. It's one of the strongest exhibitions that we've had at the college. Uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly high level uh, of, of work. Practice, a very considered install, very impressive uh, in the space. 
There is documentation on the website. We, we did do a virtual launch on, on the Saturday. You will be able to see uh, the exhibition virtually. And, and we await further guidelines as to whether we can even have some sort of a closing in May. We don't know. We, take our, we have to take our cue from, from the HSC gu guidelines, but we will keep you posted if things do change on that front. So yeah, it is strange to be here, um, but we are, we do constitute a community and a, a supportive community. And I, for one, want to, you know, it's been a, an absolute pleasure working with all six of you, our students over the course of these two years, uh, these very, very challenging years. But I can see the strength of your, your, your work, your practice. I can see the, uh, the level of ambition, the level of fortitude that you've all displayed. It's highly, highly impressive and highly inspiring. And I just want you to know that from my perspective as Dean, I remain uh, deeply inspired by how you've handled the pandemic uh, in relation to your practice and how you've moved through it and how you've held onto that ambition and how you've held onto that tenacity. It's very inspiring for me in terms of my role as a teacher and as administrator. And I hope it sets an example for, for your peers and, and, and our broader cohort of students. So a very special thank you for everything that you brought to this experience and, and as, we, as we have navigated it. Uh, I also, on a private practical note, I want to thank uh, Robert Wainwright, uh, he's probably not here, but um, Robert, uh, our facilities manager, uh, also uh, was a key uh, figure in helping to you know, work with the students under COVID uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, under, 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 we follow the guidelines and the protocols very cl closely to help with the install. So special thank you, thank you and a shout out to Robert and, and to all the BCA staff and, and our college community. Who've, we've, we've tried to work together as best we can to make this as, as manageable as an experience over the past year. So that's, uh, that's all I want to say. I'm going to keep it very, very, very brief, like I said. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from the students. And, uh, and just, I always say this, we, can, we usually do this in the gallery, but I always say this, you're now, as you graduate, you're now part of the BCA family. And we expect you to stay part of that family and not be strangers and uh, you know, stay within the orbit of the college, stay within the orbit of the college community. Under better times, some of you will be sticking around for a little bit longer, I know, but under better times, come back, do residencies, um, you know, keep us posted of your work as well. And I know those conversations will continue. So very special thanks to all of you. Congratulations on the exhibition. Deeply inspiring, highly ambitious. And, uh, and I, I want to wish you all the very best of luck for the future. So back to Anya, enough from me. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, you broke up a little bit there, but I think we all got the gist of what you were saying. And uh, what you were saying, I completely second everything. It was, it's a fantastic show this year and our graduating cohort are just one of the best groups ever. Um, we're very proud of you all and well done for uh, doing so well under such exceptional circumstances, such challenging and difficult times that we're all going through. So um, I know that all of uh, the attendees today are going to enjoy the images that I'm going to share with you now of the students' work and the students' show. And um, they're really ex it's some really exceptional works. And uh, we all look forward to hearing more about them. So I'd just like to ask you all again, and to, if you can mute your audio and your video, please, if you're not the six uh, graduating students, because it just helps the flow of the, the, the Wi-Fi work a little bit better for us here. So thank you very much. But um, uh, Brittany, I'm going to call on you first now. And uh, while we're just, while you're coming on screen, I'm going to set up the, uh, the presentation here. Just bear with me for one moment while, while I just... Sorry to go back to the beginning again. No. So, Brittany, are you there? Yep, I'm here. So can you tell us a little bit about your work in the show? I'm going to move now to your slides. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just go piece by piece. Um, but I've been really interested in, in making my own paper. And so these are um, hand cast pieces from an airplane. Um, I found an old picture of my great grandmother and the airplane next to her. I, I figured out what type it was and ordered this piece from it. Um, so yeah, this is sort of 
like a nice tribute to her, I think, but it's made out of handmade paper, um, beeswax, and it has Earl Grey tea in it. Uh, and they, they sort of hover off the wall. So I like that that element of, of floating, but I've been really interested in biomimicry. Um, and it comes out in this, this one too. Uh, I've been interested in using different materials in my work. And so this one is a watercolor wash painting um, and it has feather duck feathers on it uh, overlaid over the top of the painting. And it's a, a photo of my dad. <laughs> Titled Iceland 1992. And that's the that was the title of the Polaroid that this was taken from. Can I just um, interrupt you there, Brittany, yeah. and just ask our attendees, could you all please mute your audio in particular because there's some feedback coming from somebody uh, which is just disrupting the conversation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, Brittany, Thank carry you. on. Um this was a book that I, I compiled together of a lot of smaller works of my pieces and materials that I've been using in my studio throughout the semester. So it's kind of a, a log of the materials. Um, yeah, which I really enjoyed making this. And it was nice um, to get to use the handmade paper that I've been making in a, in a new way. Thank you very much, Brittany, for letting us know about the work and just telling us a little bit of background to everything. Can you also tell us how has your practice grown and changed since starting the MFA program over the last two years? Yeah, I think um, the MFA program gave me a lot of time and space to, to think more about my work. And I've always been really uh, interested in the environment. And so I decided to use a lot more natural materials in my work this semester, like feathers and beeswax um, and materials from the outdoor environment to make my own paper. And so I think coming here gave me the, the space to do that. And so I'm really, I'm really grateful for that. Um, and it also gave me the chance to kind of continue to, to work with figure drawing and figure painting um, and then develop these new skills too. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you. Um, just to move on now to Shannon. Shannon, would you like to talk to us a little bit about your work in this show? Well, and I'll uh, click through the different slides as you're talking. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, so my practice is based off of um, my background as a distance runner. So um, I focus on my relationship to the environment and um, sort of the dialogue between myself and the outside world. Um, yeah, and so the jacket and the um, shoes in the last slide is sort of my first object type of exploration into my art and they kind of represent the history of all of my runs um, pursued in those clothing. Um, and then the film is also a new direction for me because I was struggling um, staying with just painting because running is so movement-based. So I was looking for a more immediate um, medium to express the act of running. Um, so it's sort of a fast take. And then the painting is sort of, um, if you go to the next slide, thank you. Um, it's a, a slow take. So um, it's more of a, a reflection of the experience and the um, video is more of like a documentation, I, I guess, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, would you like to tell us how has your commute shaped your artistic practice? Yeah, so my commute is um, a large part of my life here in, in Ireland. Um, I live in Fenor, so that's about six miles from school over this mountain that's actually pictured in the, paint, the painting. Um, so it's become this sort of, um, maybe not forced because I did find it um, a challenge that I wanted to take on, but it was sort of um, a, a forced circumstance that kind of um, created this, this practice of commuting to school over this mountain every day, twice. 
and um, the commute has shaped my practice in a lot of ways, but I think one of them that stands out to me the most is sort of this, um, this, you cannot avoid the, the cycles of the day when you have um, a commute, it's more, it's very structured. So you have to go in the morning, you have to go at night, regardless of the weather. Um, but it's also, you can also observe the rhythms of the day, which are really beautiful, like the sunrise, the sunset, when the, the light expands and contracts, um, like sort of the, the um, routine of the animals, they act differently in the morning than they act at night. So it's sort of this, um, yeah, just very intimate connection with the environment, which as an ecology student is extremely important. We don't really see the full extent of the video work actually here in, in, in just a couple of slides, but the video is really stunning. Uh, it would be very interesting maybe, or would it be possible for you to put it online or screen it online for viewers to enjoy it over the next period? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can definitely give you a link yeah. for that. So worth sharing with others. Great, thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thank um, you. Moving on, Ellen. Ellen, are you there? Yes. Hello. Ellen. Yeah. So thank you, Ellen. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in the show? Yeah, sure. Um, so my my work is all using local materials, materials that I've either found in the barren and forage for myself or reclaimed materials, recycled materials that I've found around here as well. Um, I sourced, um, for, for this particular exhibition, I've been working with raw sheep wool, um, sheep intestines, uh, recycled copper and hazel, uh, which is really pre prevalent in the barren. Um, and so I, my, my materials are, or my processes, I'm, I'm a very kind of materially driven artist. And so I work with these materials and they're, they're often quite slow um, and, and repetitive motions. Um, so that ball you see there and that, that kind of branch that's uh, covered with a kind of sort of felted sleeve. Um, those I did all by hand with needle felting and all the hazel I carved back by hand. And, um, and they're quite large pieces, as you see, they're kind of taking up most of the, the space inside the gallery here. Um, and that's very important to me. I, I have a background in, in architecture, um, interior architecture specifically. And so that notion of kind of being in a space and, and the objects in that space, the tactility of the objects, the smells of the objects, um, that was yeah, that's something that's been quite innate to me um, and also developed throughout my studies here, um, researching sensory engagement and participation um, as a sort of prominent parts of my um, thesis. Well, well said, well described, Ellen. Um, one of the, I suppose what really strikes me is that the scale of your work uh, it, you know, they're really large scale pieces, uh, really powerful presence in the space. How do they work with the other artists' pieces and the other works that also have to sort of coexist within this group show? I think that they've, they've all balanced quite nicely. I'm, I'm, apart from Letitia, who's sort of in a side gallery, um, I've done... And, and the only one that's really focused on, on sculptural pieces or, or large scale sculptural pieces. So it sort of activated um, the space in that way. Um, and I also think materially it, it kind of marries quite well um, with a lot of the other pieces, Brittany's feathers um, and, you know, a lot of the-, the Hey, um, I'm on mute on everything. I'm just um, watching a group show from the Baron. Fine, a lot of the way. things that um if anybody wants to see some artworks from some sorry. new graduates he can go on mute sorry one second Alan. just i'm just going to interrupt you there Fanula gallagher i know it's you please mute <laughs> please mute <laughs> Fanula gallagher arts officer of nuig thank you uh carry on ellen um yeah i think a lot of the themes are kind of represented with like the uh, 
kind of fragility um, and, and levity um, and connection. Uh, they're kind of woven um, like very kind of, yeah, subtly throughout different people's works. And, and I, so I think they uh, are kind of seen in my pieces as well there, yeah. Great, lovely. Well done. And um, now moving on to Letitia Hill. Letitia, are you there? Hi, Letitia, are you there? I am. Hi, Wait, I am the... here. Great. <laughs> Can you Tell see me? Um, it's called the Corn Dolly Triptych. It is a collaborative. Um, I worked with. Uh, master thatchers and blacksmiths and carpenters all locally here from, um, from uh, County Clare and County Galway. Um, I worked with um, uh, Ling Liu, who is um, a, a PhD uh, student here. Um, and I was really lucky to be close to Ellen, um, our practices, um, intertwined with one another and, and we spurred each other on through the process. Um, the Corn Valley Triptych is, is three sculptures. They're approximately 10 to 12 feet tall. Um, they're all made of um, water reed and straw and each one represents a different time and place in the arc of the um, harvest ritual. And each one, um, as I was create, creating them, I challenged myself to learn new skills uh, that, and do new things with um, the mediums. Uh, so each one has a completely different feel and a completely different technique used uh, that traditionally, um, uh, represents, um, well, it represents traditional um, craftsmanship with straw and reed. Great, thank you so much. Um, can you tell us how your experience at Byrne College of Art has impacted your practice and what you see for the future? Sure, um, Anya. Um, yeah, I came when I came here two years ago or a year and a half ago. I definitely had. I knew that I had a disconnect with um, my um, with my indigenous culture, and this opportunity here gave me um, and uh, connect uh, with my heritage and. Um, gave me a language, gave me a way to communicate uh, with that. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that um, because it, it was definitely missing for me prior to coming here. Um, and for the future, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the future. I see, I see a shift in my practice more towards um, equity. I'm excited about embracing that. I have no idea what they look like. Um, so I'm off on another journey. Very good. You broke up a little bit there, but I think we all managed to hear most of your main points that you were saying. Thanks so much, Letitia. Moving on to Ashling Jelinski. Ashling, can you tell us all about your work for the show, please? Uh, yeah, so this piece is called Untitled Agora. Um, it stands about 12 feet tall and branches from two different walls onto the floor. Uh, this piece in particular is my third ever mural and I was experimenting with constructing my own scene. As you can see, I really love utilizing Greek and Roman sculpture in my work. And it's particularly because um, the brokenness of them all. I think we tend to gloss over and mentally fill in those gaps without critically analyzing them. And I uh, use a really highly saturated palette, often noted with a lot of blue. 
um, and which recalls the polychromatic truth of these sculptures that they've been whitewashed throughout history, literally and kind of figuratively. And then this piece is what I've worked on most of the semester. It spans all three walls of my studio and is about 37 feet wide. And it's called Pergamonium because the sculptures I used uh, all came from the Pergamon Temple, which has a whole museum dedicated to it in Berlin and it's beautiful. And I have been especially investigating um, the void space and disembodiment and dissociation through these figures, particularly because when I'm painting, it's when I feel most embodied in myself. And uh, this, I'm particularly proud of this piece. And the name Pergamonium, uh, the, the suffix I-U-M, it's kind of a vague suffix in Latin, at least given my understanding of it, but one of the meanings of using that suffix is to describe an activity that's done in a space, such as an auditorium, you listen to things. Um, and then, so by titling it Pergamonium, I, it suggests that there's an activity to be done when you're within this space, but what that activity is, is vague and undefined. Great, thank you so much. And can you tell us a little bit about your trajectory of development over the last two years in the MFA program? Yeah, when I first got here, I was working mostly oil on canvas. And the summer before starting at BCA, I had been branching into ink. But then this year, I just, I just felt like it, it made sense for my work to transfer from being on paper on the wall to directly on the wall. So last semester I had my first mural piece and then I dedicated this final semester to murals specifically. And it's not something I ever saw happening in my practice, but since it has happened, I've absolutely loved it. I'm excited to see where that takes me in the future, um, whether that's in public art spaces or inside of buildings. I'm not sure where it will live yet, but and also being a BCA kind of gave me the time and space and like solitude needed to get into my practice and figure out what it was about and what it was what was driving me and why I was drawn to these figures because I knew it wasn't a really obvious reason but I, I wasn't sure how to articulate that and so now I have the like ability to speak about my work which I never had before. Burn College uh, Art Show Great. Great. Thank you. Just remind everybody again to mute your audio. I know it's difficult to remember all these things when you're attending an event as well. So uh, we forgive everybody, <laughs> forgive you all for, for uh, these sometimes a little audio um, uh, mistakes that happen. And so, yeah, thanks, Ashley. I think you're finished there anyway, were you? Yep. Um, and last but not least, Sam Khan. Sam? Hi. Where would you like to um, talk about your work, please? So these pieces are part of a series that I've done investigating my own mental health. Um, I have done a lot of different kinds of art, but I landed on photography as something that was really comforting to me, um, partially because I have a background in it and partially because I have a camera that belonged to my grandfather that is over 50 years old that still works because it's an amazing piece of machinery. Um, and once the lockdown started, I had a lot of- In the border uh, last night, that some of our ancestors were black with blue eyes. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. A lot of resurgent symptoms. So I started taking pictures of myself when I was having these symptoms um, and ended up printing them on extremely large bed sheets and then embroidering over that because uh, embroidery is actually something that I use when I'm like sitting down for a three hour lecture, I have to keep my hands busy, otherwise I will just explode. <laughs> um, so I started embroidering as a way to deal with that. And then it kind of wove itself into my photographic work. Um, so yeah, these this whole series is basically talking about the experience of mental health symptoms and the fact that they are so stigmatized that we can't look them in the eye. And so all of them have very intentional um, direct gaze to try and combat that. And can you tell us a little bit about how your work sort of functions in the context of the overall show? Um, I, 
when talking to Patrick Murphy a couple of weeks ago, um, he pointed out that uh, Brittany's and my work have a really interesting play off each other, that they're similar palettes and they're kind of similar fuzziness, I think, um, similar abstraction. And so we kind of put those on two opposite walls so that they would play off of each other. Um, but I think a lot of our work work like fits really well together and completely unintentionally. I mean, other than the fact that we've been here for two years and we've been playing off each other and talking about each other's work and looking at each other's work and getting feedback from each other. I think it's only natural that some of our work is going to blend into each other. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it, when placed in the gallery, it's in a really good resting place. I, think, I was actually sick last night. I couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> which I really hope um, encourages people. I mean, if anybody ever gets to see it, um, to sit and really spend some time with it. Great, thank you, Sam. Well said. Um, we're just at the end now of the of the talks themselves with each individual artist. Um, maybe there's some questions from from the audience, and uh, if there are, they maybe should come in on the chat function. So I might just stop the share so that we can have a look at chat and see what uh, people are asking. I'm just uh, Letitia Ruby is asking, could you talk about the symbolism and use of ritual in your work? Yes, gladly. Um... So ritual, it's, it's more about the frame of a ritual that actually um, started this process off. Um, and it, it became something bigger because even in the making, ritual became apparent, you know, with, with the ritual of making. But obviously with the corn dolly, um, the history of the corn dollies themselves, uh, embedded in the uh, harvest ritual, um, which interestingly enough, uh, the first corn dolly represents um, the harvest ritual from the 18th dynasty. And it's from a, hier a hieroglyphic, um, uh, hieroglyphics on a tomb. And as we go through time, we still celebrate the harvest ritual, exactly how this ritual is actually played out on this 18th dynasty tomb. And I just found it fascinating how, and it's not just about it being in, um, um, in Egypt, it's, it's played out you know, throughout the world. And I, find, I found that very fascinating. Um, as far as symbolism, yes, the first corn dolly just manifested itself in a very triangular um, uh, design. And then as I moved into the Celtic corn dolly, um, you know, that, that has more of a pagan um, feel to it. It, it. it was all about circles and, um, you know, this inner weaving of, 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 of line that is not direct. And then uh, the AKA um, Robot Maria um, corn dolly, which represents the future, um, became more square and more, more confined and harder um, lines, which represents in my mind, you know, what we're dealing with um, at, at present. Thank you so much, Letitia. Ellen, Katerina Gribkoff is asking, can you explain your material choices like using rejected materials such as brown wool? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Katerina, for the question. Um, it's actually become a very important part of my practice is, is utilizing these obsolete or undervalued materials, especially. Um, I actually had a really hard time getting a hold of sheep intestines in the end which used to be used for guitar strings or uh, violin strings, sausage casings. And, and now there's a, a, you know, they're, they're pretty much either incinerated or used for animal food. And um, th these materials that were once so, um, so common and so practical um, and that are natural to, to, to the lands in which we live, they're actually kind of being disregarded in favor of the polyester alternatives or the mass manufactured alternatives. And I think that's a real shame. And, and 
I think that by, by re-engaging materially, um, spatially, tactily with these objects, um, it, it might help us to um, kind of find a place for their use again or, or not, not to kind of fear these materials again. There's a real kind of irks and quality which can come from even just the raw wool um, and especially the intestines as well. But, but they, they have um, beautiful kind of aesthetic and material and, and then also practical qualities, um, which I'd like to, to try and highlight. Great, thank you, Ellen, for that. Um, question for Shannon from Ruby. How has your work changed now that you are using the moving image? What are the ways you could explore these journeys differently using video? Yeah, I think my work has changed, or at least my my perception of my environment has changed using film because um, there's a new curiosity that I feel when looking around me while I'm running. Like when I'm painting, I'm really just looking for a, a compelling static image that's singular. But with moving image, I'm looking for repetition in the environment and I'm more in tune with, with sound and, and my own footsteps and my own rhythm. Um, so it's sort of this, it's just fleshed out a, a larger dimension of, of experiencing a run through, through art. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Amy, uh, it's Southeast of Disorder. I'm fascinated by this piece. Can you share anything about it? I'm not sure, is that one of your pieces, Ashwin? That was one of mine. Yeah, I, oh, I put it. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I put it in the chat. Um, yeah, it must have. It must have been from looking, but um, yeah, that piece. It's a. It's another photograph of my dad, um, with duck feathers on the side, and it was taken in in Louisiana. So I like that sort of element to it. Um, for my my home, but uh. Yeah, I just think it's a really a, a nice image. It's a it's a funny image almost like um, just from knowing him, like the the gun kind of slinging along his shoulder is sort of very typical <laughs> of him. But um, yeah, yeah, I think it is named Southeast of Disorder Disorder Two after uh, a Jimmy Buffett song. So it's another thing he used to he used to sing to me. So. I like having that element of memory in my my practice and my work, and it's been sort of permeating more lately. Great, thank you. Well said. Um, Ashling, Katarina asks, could you talk about your move your move to go off the wall and onto the floor? And do you have any more ideas that you want to try? Yeah, um, like I had said before, the transition from paper onto the wall seemed really natural because I hated framing my work and I was looking for ways for my work to simply exist on the void space of the wall. And I had played around in my undergrad a little bit with branching onto the floor and I figured why not try that with this piece and I was already pushing it, the dimensions by having it bisect two different walls and crossing across a corner and cr crossing it onto the floor. Um, I don't know if there's a particular reason for it other than just making it a more immersive environment. I played with it in a more conventional sense in my studio space where I just had the thick bands and I was thinking a lot about the Pompeian murals. And so I was trying to break out of that frame of my blue band, which I did in a few spots, but with my gallery piece, just really pushing it onto the floor and if there had been a lower ceiling I would probably even try to branch onto the ceiling and really create a little corner that just envelops your vision from all directions and yeah so I think that would be something I'd love to try sometime is a fully immersive mural that branches ceiling floor walls if I could even paint on a window sometime I think that would be a really interesting way to play with it in the future thank you Sounds, sounds great, Ashling. And I have a question for Sam. Can you talk a little bit about the scale of your pieces? Because I think that's a really interesting factor in your work, actually. Yeah, um, they. I started off this project trying to make them exactly life-size um, and then found as I moved up in size, they got more immersive and they got more 
visually interesting and more engaging to the audience, um, which the whole point of this project is to spend time with them and really come, I mean, not that I'm ever telling anyone what to see when they look at my work, but uh, my hope is that they end up being a space that people can really think about mental illness and other stigmatized um, disorders or ways of life that ha are so made so much worse by the stigma that is applied to them and really think about it from a different point of view and come away with um, more understanding or more empathy maybe than they had going in. And it really, I found that it was really um, successful to make them big and make them big enough that you can like fall into them and really spend time with them. Great, well said. Mm -hmm. um, there's just one more final question now before we draw our event to a close. I see Joe Pendery is asking Ellen, how much of your material gathering process influences your piece's architecture? Interesting question given your background, isn't it, in yeah. interior architecture? Yeah, hey Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess it's not so much at this stage in the gathering um, that, that forms or that informs um, what I end up doing with them. It's more like once I've, I've gathered and started working with the materials, um, I kind of almost I do all my processes and then I, I get them in the space that I've got um, and then I see how they come together. So it's, it's often site specific in that sense um, in, in that I really just, it, it's not until the very end um, that I can sort of marry the piece. Um, and for example, kind of working with um, removing the bark of the hazel um, it wasn't so much where when I collected them and the space that I collected them in, though potentially that influenced it on a, on a sort of more subconscious level. Um, but I think it's the qualities of the, the materials um, and their, their forms, their colours, um, their textures that I, I sort of like to play off one another. Thank you so much, Ellen, and uh, very well said. And on that note, I think there's no more questions coming from the audience. I'd like to uh, bring this event to a close by thanking you all, all of the wonderful artists who have presented their work here today and talked so well about their practice and shared their ideas with you and the sort of insights behind what they've made for their final MFA degree show. And I'd also like to thank all of our audience, our attendees, uh, it's so great to have you all here. I'm just looking down through the list of very notable and uh, luminous characters from all over the world who have attended today. So it's so great to have you all here with us virtually in this space. Uh, so for us to celebrate the uh, great achievements of our MFA students work. So thank you all. Let's give everybody a, a little round of applause. Maybe you can unmute yourselves. Just give a little round of applause and uh, we'll leave it at that. And, Everybody can just leave. Well done, everyone.